So good afternoon and welcome to everyone. Uh, over the next hour, we're going to explore a range of education issues uh, with the overriding theme of what steps can be taken to improve educational opportunities for all students. Uh, and we'll save time at the end for some questions. We're most fortunate this morning, this afternoon, to have four knowledgeable, opinionated panelists. Uh, I'd like to begin on my far right here uh, with Michael Crow. He's president of Arizona State University. And they are ranked number one in the nation for innovation by US News and World Report. For the past 14 years, Michael has and continues to lead ASU's evolution as the new American university, described by many news accounts as one of the most radical redesigns in higher learning. ASU has established 15 transdisciplinary schools, a range of research initiatives focused on public value and impact, and a dramatically expanding learning technology infrastructure. And all of this has been achieved while achieving record levels of diversity. Michael, welcome to the panel. It's a pleasure to have you today. Thank you. Third, to my right, is Nicholas Dirks, and he's chancellor of the University of California Berkeley, I should add my undergraduate alma mater. He's an internationally renowned historian and anthropologist. Chancellor Dirk's numerous scholarly honors include both MacArthur Foundation and Guggenheim Fellowships. Among his many priorities, and I can assure you, being the head of a UC, being a head of a UC major university is uh, quite challenging. But among Nick's many priorities, He's committed to accessible, high-quality undergraduate education in the liberal arts and sciences, and is a passionate advocate for globalization of the university. Nick, thank you for joining with us today. Thank you. Next is Eva Moskowitz. She's founder and CEO of Success Academy Charter Schools, New York City's highest performing charter schools. Students, largely inner city and low income, score in the state's top 1% in math, the top 3% in English. Eva launched her first school 10 years ago, structured according to lessons learned while chair of the New York City Council Education Committee. Today, Success Academy has 41 schools, demonstrating serious achievement. Eva, thank you for leaving the battles of New York today to join us. Thanks for having me. And Kristen Van Hook is Senior Vice President for Policy and Development for the nonprofit National Institute for Excellence in Teaching, or NIET. Kristen's strategic work at federal, state, and district levels is focused on the critical issue of teacher effectiveness. Her efforts are instrumental to NIET's key initiatives, the TAP System for Teacher and Student Advancement, and the Educator Effectiveness Best Practices Center, which today directly impact more than 250,000 teachers and 2.5 million students in diverse public schools across America. So let's begin today with a brief tutorial. So while historically education policy in America has been the responsibility of states, over the past 60 years, the federal government has leveraged its funding and used its bully pulpit to encourage reforms to improve access and quality of education for all students. In 1965, the first Elementary and Secondary School Act was passed with the principal goal of providing increased funding for educational services, focusing on low-income, disadvantaged students. Yet despite more than $200 billion directed to these programs to help disadvantaged children over the past half century, tragically, national assessments still show that almost half of black and Hispanic fourth graders are unable to read, and a third cannot perform even the most basic math skills. With each reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Schools Act came a renewed promise to improve K-12 education. In 1994, under President Clinton, 
the Educate America Act, or GOALS 2000, set ambitious achievement goals for American students that would be accomplished by the turn of the century, none of which were accomplished. In 2002, No Child Left Behind expanded federal influence on states to drive standard-based reform with measurable goals, assessment, and accountability for all subgroups. For the first time, districts and schools were not able to hide behind the averages. The passage of the 2009 American Recovery and Reinvestment Act provided competitive grants for educational improvement, including Race to the Top. Though standards have been developed in the years since, student achievement growth overall as a nation has been limited, and in particularly for disadvantaged students. The passage of the new federal law just this last December called Every Student Succeeds Act resets expectations surrounding the role of the federal government. Now the law continues to provide a federal role in determining interventions for the lowest performing schools, but states and districts will now design and implement policies to advance academic goals and measurements of achievements as well as educator effectiveness in K-12 classrooms. Which brings me to my first question today, and I'll direct it to Kristen. Many reform advocates contend that the theme of local control in the new federal law, ESSA, is in actuality a move toward less accountability for districts and states. And will a diminished federal role take pressure off states and districts to continue to drive reform or even begin reforms, especially in those areas where federal funding has been leveraged to advocate for higher standards, rigorous assessments, teacher effectiveness, and accountability. Kristen? Thank you, Lowell, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Um, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about, uh, you, you mentioned in your slides that the federal government has taken many different approaches to reform over the years. And I think it's fair to say that the No Child Left Behind Act was essentially a uh, result of frustration, uh, bipartisan frustration, that those numbers hadn't moved. And that despite uh, significant federal investment, now again, the federal investment is probably around 10 percent roughly uh, for schools, so it's not huge, but it has a lot of leverage, and that that investment over many years was not having an impact. And in fact, we were seeing some of the numbers going in the opposite direction. Uh, so clearly there was uh, a lot of frustration that led to that. Um, many people highlighted, and you had in your slide, the importance of setting standards, of having high expectations, um, setting the goal of proficiency for all students, uh, no child left behind. Uh, but the problem was, uh, over time, that when people didn't meet those standards, uh, the result was that the federal government got very involved in, in determining uh, solutions. So if there was a theme to the passage of this most recent bill in December, uh, which also had very broad bipartisan support, uh, it was let's fix NCLB. Let's get out of this era of the, of the federal government stepping in and labeling schools based on their results, um, driving specific interventions, um, and also through the waiver process, as people were missing those targets, uh, pushing for particular standards or for particular approaches on teacher effectiveness. So I think the frustration level was clearly that it's, uh, you can require someone to do something, but you can't require them to do it well. And we were seeing that that was really playing out. Um, at the same time, I think there has been a recognition that that era, and you touched on this just now, that era resulted in, call it the NCLB and waiver era, a lot of movement forward on uh, higher standards, for example, for students. So even as there is pushback on the common core, um, if you start to look at each state, um, the, the Iowa core and other state um, standards they've adopted uh, reflect many of the elements of the common core. So again, the idea that, that a national standard is not something states are, might support, um, but really that was a state-driven initiative, and we're seeing it now kind of come back to the state level. Um, we still see under the new law that there's accountability by subgroups in terms of testing requirements, and so that's going to be important, the transparency of, of knowing how different uh, subgroups of students are doing. And instead of, of requiring teacher quality, highly qualified teachers, as was the requirement under the old bill, 
um, there's an effort now to focus on effectiveness. And this, as you know, has been a huge part of the work at, at National Institute for Excellence in Teaching, where we really want to start to look at outputs, uh, the result of teaching, and not necessarily those things that uh, are not correlated with student achievement. Uh, years of experience and degrees, research is showing, uh, are not are not highly correlated. The other thing I wanted to mention just briefly is um, with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act in 2009, what was interesting there and what has been built on since, um, with a, a pretty big influx of funds through that act, uh, Race to the Top and several other innovative funds were created, investing in innovation, and some existing federal funds, uh, the Teacher Incentive Fund, for example, were dramatically increased. So it went from 100 million to 400 million at the time. It since has come down slightly. Um, and those competitive funds showed us a number of, of really powerful things. The federal government usually uses formula funds to, to send money to districts and states. There are minimum requirements associated with those funds. These competitive funds really encouraged people to think about how to propose something that would be powerful, something that would lead to strong results to help set those goals and results in their applications. And we saw the results. So Tennessee is a great example um, who won the first round of Race to the Top along with Delaware. Um, they put some pretty strong requirements in place. It had a, it had a very broad state policy impact for them. Um, other states were not, you know, right first in line to apply. Um, and as we saw the race to the fund start to go down the list of states and the waiver requirements kick in with a number of states, um, we started to see maybe a, a little less dramatic change. But still, the competitive funds, I think uh, everyone would pretty much agree, had some impact in terms of state policy. I want to just quickly pull up slide 91. So on the issue of teacher effectiveness, which we touched on, um, as I mentioned, a number of states put that in place. That was one of the requirements of Race to the Top. It was also a requirement in the waiver. Um, but if you put up slide 92, often when you get a, a policy in place, though, one of the real questions as you go forward is, is that going to have a real impact? So yes, we have evaluations in place. Will they be any different? Will we use them to inform professional development, um, to talk about uh, compensation related to those, or, or other things that are important in terms of uh, changing practice? So just to quickly wrap up on ESSA, I think uh, we, we've seen a lot of um, consistency in terms of the idea that the federal government will continue to play an important role in terms of civil rights, providing funding for low-income students, um, especially a role with the lowest performing 5% of schools. Um, but they'll, they'll put states and districts in the driver's seat on many other um, standards, how they're going to measure those standards, proficiency targets, um, and also teacher effectiveness. Um, so let me briefly stop there. Okay. And I think, uh, Kristen, you touch on a number of, diff number of different ideas. Um, I've seen the federal role as being one of uh, the most productive area of the federal role has been one of innovation, uh, where they have stimulated uh, you know, ideas like performance pay, uh, rigorous teacher evaluation that actually has as part of its element student learning growth um, and things of that nature. The, uh, the challenge will be going forward now without the federal government stimulating that kind of innovation and having accountability, will states push forth reforms? And I think the answer must be is that where states have good leadership and they've been doing active things in the reform area, they'll probably continue to do so. And those states that have basically sat on their hands and done nothing, they're going to have a lot less pressure now from the federal government to accomplish <laughs> for young people. Um, while we're on the subject of teacher effectiveness, I thought I would go to uh, Eva for just a moment. Obviously, we believe that teacher effectiveness and research shows that is the single most important in-school factor that drives student growth. Uh, the, the research is absolutely clear on this issue. And uh, as I always like to say, uh, that, there's, that the uh, quality of an educational system cannot exceed the quality of its educators. So Eva, obviously, you're driving for some serious achievement growth among your students and the most highly challenged uh, clientele and so on. So teacher quality must be a key issue for you. How, how can you assure yourself as you uh, develop your teacher core and you hire new teachers that they come to, the, to your schools with the content knowledge and also that they have the ability to relate to the individual students that you have in your schools. Maybe you could talk a little bit about 
how you approach the teacher quality issue. Sure, and I, I couldn't agree more that teacher quality is of the utmost importance. I think there's a real difference, though, between what is happening today and what was happening 50 years ago. Uh, and I, I think that is a product of uh, the labor market. So 50 or 60 years ago, uh, frankly, because women were limited in so many other professions, you had this incredibly high concentration of unbelievably well-educated and talented women who were in the classroom. Now that uh, folks can do uh, uh, what they want, you actually have a, a far less prepared uh, teaching force. And you can see that in uh, you know, SAT scores of teachers or um, content uh, mastery is just not what it was. Uh, and so we are finding as a school that frankly we can't rely on the schools of education. They are not, I'm not saying there aren't some really good ones, uh, but for, you know, I have to hire 916 teachers by June 30th. And frankly, uh, the, uh, and I've hired 536 plus one this morning, that's 537, and who's counting? Uh, it's really challenging to find teachers who, uh, you know, one of the things I, I do with teachers in an interview is I will give uh, a seventh grade math teacher candidate the fifth grade math test, and they can't always ace it. That is a problem. That is a huge problem. And if you go down the content areas and you say, well, who's teaching our kids to write and what is the level of writing mastery, it frankly is nowhere near where it needs to be. And so that is uh, a real challenge. So um, one could throw up one's hands and say, well, let's wait till the schools of education fix that problem. Or one could be a problem solver and say, well, how are we going to teach our teachers the math that they need? We are fortunately attracting smart, talented people, so they're capable, uh, but we find that we have to train our teachers in the content uh, areas, particularly in math and science, although also in writing. Uh, the one other thing I would say is while there's a tremendous emphasis on teacher quality, I think it's easy to say to yourself, well, the person in front of the room must be highly qualified. And there are a couple of things about that. Teachers in our schools are not up in the front of the room, or they're there uh, very briefly. Uh, we do a lot of guided practice and independent practice. We believe that children learn best by doing rather than the sage on the stage approach. So they really have to be able to work the room and get 34 kids simultaneously to master the material. But with this emphasis on teacher quality, I think there's been um, a neglect of the principal. And I would argue that uh, your principal is uh, a key leverage point because the principal, at least in our model, is the instructional leader. And many traditional district schools, the principal is actually making sure the buses come on time and go. They're managing the lunchroom. They're managing supplies. But at Success Academies, the principal <laughs> is the instructional leader. And they have to run planning meetings. And they have to look at student work. And they have to manage instructionally. I call it sort of, it's like managing an ice cream store, except uh, it's student work that you're managing. And we find that we have to run very extensive principal training. Just because you know the classroom doesn't mean that you know how to manage down the line so that all of your teachers are getting the student outcomes that you want. We do 13 weeks of principal training every single year. So we are investing very heavily in making sure that the instructional leaders in our building know how to get student outcomes. And by the way, student outcomes, while we're very proud and on, uh, I think, slide 74, uh, you can see the data. While we're very proud of, of these uh, results, um, data is really the score at the end of the game. It doesn't tell you how to get there, and it doesn't tell you um, what you need to do to improve. We place a great deal of emphasis on being able to look at student work and figure out 
how the kid is thinking about the math problem or how the kid is thinking about the writing challenge. Uh, and so we don't talk about data without talking about student work. Once you know what the score is at the end of the game, then you've got to go back and really become expert at studying student work. Um, I would say that in defense of schools of education, and I am not standing up here to defend them per se, but there are, as you mentioned, a few gems among schools of education that have actually taken steps to make the pre-service education relevant to the realities of the classroom that those, te those uh, teacher, those soon-to-be teachers are going to be engaged in. And I would say to you that Arizona State is certainly one of the most innovative, and they're also one of the largest producers of teachers in our nation. Michael, when you came in many years ago as president, uh, I would say that you found a school of education not dissimilar than most of the schools of education around the country, and you decided to take steps to transform that. Maybe you could briefly comment about how difficult that was and what you did. Well, so first, I mean, it's just a small slice of the changes that we've been able to facilitate at the university, and we, like UCLA, which started as the Los Angeles State Teachers College and the University of California at Santa Barbara that started as a home economics college until 1944, we were, we were a teacher's college. We were the territorial teacher's college for the territory of Arizona. Uh, by the time I arrived uh, in 2002, it had become basically more of a, a theoretical uh, organization, uh, you know, sort of thinking through what the idealized form of what a teacher might need to be. And so what we decided to do over some time, and we implemented this 10 years ago, was to deconstruct it back to a root the root being that the core and only principal objective was to produce the teacher, the teacher capable of learning anything, to be able to be a teacher through their career. That's a very important methodological assumption that we have. Uh, and then also to have the entire faculty and all of its research devoted to the success of that, of that teacher. So we deconstructed it. We exited 45 faculty members. Uh, we uh, took its name from College of Education to Teachers College. We uh, raised uh, more than $150 million of new investment from public and private sources. We realigned its role and its function. We built teacher tracking mechanisms. We built responsibility indexes. We built uh, feedback loops for how our teachers were doing. Uh, a core that we did above the level of the teacher's college <clears throat> was to alter the charter of the university. And the third realm of the charter of the university now is that we take responsibility for the outcome of our community. So if the community's educational outcomes are, sub, are substandard or not sufficient, if the health and well-being of the community is, is inadequate to its assignment or to the success of the community, the, the uh, university itself is responsible for that outcome and takes responsibility for that outcome. And so in the redesign and the reconstruction of the Teachers College, we uh, built a relationship with Teach for America. We re-altered uh, the admission requirements to the Teachers College. Uh, there's now a psychological profile, a learning assessment profile, as well as academic profiles uh, necessary. It's no longer the college that you go to if you're afraid of math or you're math phobic. Uh, we created a program where our we have 17,000 engineering students uh, as, uh, at, at ASU. Those engineering students can now get a math teaching certificate in their back pocket along the way with no additional time. So we then altered the role of the teacher's college throughout the rest of the institution at the same time, altering who we're producing as teachers, how we're producing teachers, how we're enabling teachers. And right now we're working on a platform uh, uh, for a uh, Canadian foundation where we're building a tool for lifelong learning with all of our deployed teachers, where they're constantly, every day, engaged in a massive le learning and leadership-oriented network. And what we've seen are, are fantastic outcomes. We also built our own charter schools uh, to be able to demonstrate that on the same dime that everybody else gets in the state, uh, we can graduate every single student, regardless of their family circumstance, and that all of them can go to post-secondary something. Uh, and so we've been able to do that, as well as in one of the charter schools, have 60% of them become STEM majors in, in colleges and universities. And so those are the kinds of things that we've done in the last 10 years. And the other thing you have is you also have the mm -hmm. I Teach uh, Arizona program yes. and so on, where a student, as I understand it, in their senior year will not be at the university, but will actually be located in a school district right. 
doing their teaching and also taking their pedagogy within that school district. It, it, goes, so, it goes all the way back to Dewey and all of Dewey's theories, which somehow we forgot, which was that you learn best by doing something. And so if you can then augment that learner with the technological envelope and the technological support system that we've built uh, for that learner, that now the teacher is the learner, we think of it much more like uh, you know, the sensei in uh, a dojo, you know, where uh, everyone is a teacher and everyone is a student, going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so, uh, so we're operating on that sort of modality. Huh? Just one quick comment I would, I would add to that, and we've been doing some great work in support and in partnership with ASU, is that the districts have a responsibility as you create teachers who are um, better prepared to be successful in the classroom and they know what's going to be expected of them, particularly in a high-need district, that the district has a responsibility, and I know you're working with districts to say, how can we set up those teachers for success over time? So we can't just drop them into a school sink or swim like the old, uh, the old approach. We've got to have a system in place so that they can continue to be lifelong learners. They expect that now, given the program they've gone through. What does that look like? So you need to find a way to have teacher leaders or, or, or instructional coaches that support those new teachers as they come into the classroom. And the other piece you had mentioned earlier, just briefly, I, I think it's worth looking at, at the slide uh, 80. Um, we need to think about the profession and how it's going to both attract and retain t people. And you know, I think a lot of talented young people are interested in, in the possibility of making more money and, and having an additional roles and responsibilities, being able to grow in their career if they're successful. So that, that's something that I think can be tied with the work that's being done with districts to say, how can we better support new teachers and how can they grow over their career? Right, and how can we offer them roles and responsibilities where they can have uh, increased compensation uh, in assuming those roles and so on. I'd like to turn our attention for just a moment now to college readiness. Um, just last week, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or NAEP, released uh, these results. It's called the Nation's Report Card for 12th grade students in math and reading. And uh, they're quite revealing, to say the least. As you can see, only about a quarter of 12th graders reach a level of proficiency in mathematics. And only about a third of 12th graders reach a level of proficiency in reading. And proficiency is, being the, le is the level required to attain a mastery of a subject area. And despite the focus on improving math skills that we've heard over and over again in this country over the last decade, you can see here that from 2005, virtually no progress has been made. And when we look at proficiency levels in mathematics of students by race, these results are particularly troublesome. Despite a focus on edu educational outcomes for disadvantaged students for a half century, in 2015, only 7% of black and 12% of Hispanic 12th graders reach a level of proficiency. A recent report found that nearly one in four students, more than a half a million college freshmen, have to enroll in a remedial course during their first year. And it should be noted that we're not speaking of those students who only attend community colleges because quite the contrary, almost half of the students taking a remedial course or one or more are entering four-year colleges. And moreover, it isn't just low-income students who need assistance. You can see here on this slide, when we add it up, that 44% of these students come from middle, upper middle, and higher income families. Other measures also point to a lack of readiness among high school graduates. We see that 39% of high school graduates, the 31% and the 8% combined, take a curriculum that is considered college ready. Less than half of those students who take that curriculum attain a level of mastery. And in this case, mastery is defined as they earned at least a 2.5 grade average. A very good reason why only 28% of high school graduates who took the ACT in 2015 met college preparedness in four tested subject areas. So now I'd like to turn back. I'm first going to go to Michael again and then to Nick. Michael, obviously at Arizona State University, you have a broad group of students who you are accepting at your university. You can't self-select just the top echelon of them. What approach have you taken at ASU to assist those students 
who might be entering ASU needing assistance to bring their skill levels up so they can handle the rigor of the academic program that you're offering mm -hmm. at ASU. So a couple of comments on that. And so all of these statistics are reflective of uh, not the students, they're reflective of the schools and the teachers. There's no, cha there's no reason that a person uh, with a normal functioning brain can't master all these subjects at this level. It, it's, it's basically not uh, that uh, complicated. And so what that means is there's something else going on. And so the way that we approach things is, uh, first I have to give you some sense of the scale of the institution. So in, when we open for the fall 2016 semester in uh, August, we'll have 6,000 incoming freshmen with A averages from high school, 6,000 incoming freshmen that come in under the historic University of California admission standards of 50 years ago with B averages, that as they've taken all these courses, they have a B in each of those courses and they have a B average. And we'll also, uh, over the year, take 11,000 community college transfer students. So we'll call that 20, 23,000 fresh undergraduates showing up. They are from the entire socioeconomic diversity of our society. They are 20% are at or below the poverty level. 46% uh, of the freshmen are students of color. Uh, so it's a very diverse group of individuals coming in. We offer no remedial instruction. Uh, we think it is demeaning. Uh, what we offer is uh, basically various pathways to success. And so we offer active and adaptive learning platforms. We offer seven and a half week intensive modules. We've changed the semester, changed the structure, changed the design of the institution. We have, a, no, there's no, nobody gets off from anything. Everybody has to do the math, the science. Everyone has to move forward. And so what we found was in uh, gateway classes, for instance, where math and science was, dem demands were very significant. Freshman classes were h historically classes where half the students couldn't get through the class with a B or better. Of those students that didn't do that, they were usually trying to track to do something else. Half of them quit the university at that point, historically. So uh, several years ago, we began technologically mediating through individualized learning platforms and indiv individualized learning tools, a way in which that non-success rate's gone from 50% to 15% and 12% or 10% in some classes. And so, so through the introduction of highly individualized and personalized learning activities on a couple hundred of our 20,000 overall courses, we've found a way to uh, be able to take the learning process for an individual student and make it so focused on them that we're seeing dramatically enhanced uh, uh, success. A doubling of our four-year graduation rate, uh, fantastic success across ethnicities and family incomes. And so it's through the introduction of technology and the embedding of that technology into our overall environment that it has enabled us to be able to take on this challenge. Nick, obviously the students coming to Berkeley are, are a different composition to some extent, but maybe you could reflect. I'm sure you have some students coming to the university where maybe their skills in particular areas are not up to a certain level, but maybe you could talk a little bit about the composition of the students you have at Berkeley mm -hmm. and what approach you take. Indeed, and I'll just say this as a personal note to begin with, is that Michael and I first met when we were both at Columbia University in New York, so we both came out of a private uh, top quality research university to our respective public universities. And we did this in part because of a great belief in the huge importance, uh, the transformational uh, character of these, uh, of these research universities. Michael's done extraordinary work at ASU. Uh, the story of, uh, of its uh, achievement and accomplishment over the past, what, 14 years since you've been there is really uh, breathtaking. And I uh, uh, offer you great uh, kudos for everything you've done there. Now, I came to a university, of course, that was routinely ranked not just as the finest public university in the country, but one of the finest research universities, private or public. Uh, Berkeley is So routinely, in other words, I left a good yeah. legacy there. Is that right? <laughs> you did indeed. And, you know, and he's so, hoping for more legacy. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't thinking about it in that fashion. I didn't even ask him to say that. <laughs> but, you know, but Berkeley, as, as everyone knows, it's, 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 it's ranked uh, as one of the top four or five universities. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's got uh, Nobel laureates uh, uh, who get parking places. That's all we need to do for them at Berkeley in order to recognize them. And they take uh, up a lot of parking spaces. They, because they take up almost, uh, yes, indeed. Yes. But, you know, we're going to have to get a few more, I think, next fall. And uh, 
uh, and some of you might have even heard some of our potential Nobel uh, Prize winners speak earlier in this in this uh, session in, in in at the institute. But uh, but to your question, what is extraordinary is here you have such a great university, and yet it still has extraordinary diversity in terms of its student body. Uh, to the question you asked, Michael, we don't use remediation. We do have bridge programs, and we think of this as, in fact, a bridging from high school to college. And of course, coming to Berkeley is hard. Uh, we think it's, and I'm sure you can attest to this, harder than, say, that other school on the other side of the bay that sometimes gets uh, more attention than we do. But, uh, but they didn't admit anyone this year. <laughs> <laughs> that was an April 1st story, yes, but exactly. uh, I tend to believe it. Uh, but the, uh, uh, but the, student, the student body uh, is made up, uh, overall, of about a third Pell Grant eligible students. Now, whether you take this as the poverty line or however you take it, it's roughly families making less than $45,000, $50,000. And I have to say, for a, a university of, of this quality, to have a third of our students Pell Grant eligible is extraordinary. And of course, it also means and you've seen uh, uh, all the statistics that support uh, these correlations, that they come from schools that have been challenged as well as uh, other challenges that they've individually experienced. And so coming to, coming to Berkeley can be very hard. So we do work with students. We have bridge programs. We have tutorials. We have all kinds of efforts that uh, are underway to make sure that our students can take full advantage of every extraordinary opportunity the university has. But there are still some issues. Uh, for example, uh, when you think about uh, what it takes to get admission to the most, uh, uh, the most com competitive programs and the most sought after programs like computer science today, you realize that you really have to have calculus in high school. You realize you really have to have advanced mathematical proficiency. And because of state funding being what it is, and I'll say more about that in a minute, uh, the, uh, some of our majors are capped. And we don't, uh, we don't cap them on the basis of uh, some uh, uh, pre-existent set of courses, but they, they, do, they do reflect the fact that some students have access and some don't uh, to certain kinds of prepar preparation and, uh, in, in, in the high school year. So we've been working with high schools. We've been working through various kinds of tutorial programs. We've been working with the state and, uh, and others to try to see what we can do to make sure everybody really does uh, have a level playing field when they, when they come to Berkeley. But by the same token, we're at a place now where 13% of our budget is provided by the state. When my predecessor, Bob Bergenau, started uh, as chancellor, as the ninth chancellor in 2004, it was more than 30%. In 2008, we lost from somewhere over $500 million a year to something like $250 million a year. Basically, we lost half our funding, and we aren't anywhere close uh, uh, back to where we were in 2008. So of course, we charge tuition. It's still a bargain compared to Columbia. It's $13,000 for in-state students. Columbia went over $50,000 for its tuition, I think, about three years ago. Uh, we, of course, like Arizona State and other uh, top public universities, give a lot of financial aid. Uh, and, of course, the Pell Grant students themselves not only get federal money, they get state money, they get money from the university. But the kinds of challenges that, that students have coming to this great university are, are very significant. At the same time, that I want to stress the importance of our great system of public higher education. If you take Berkeley and UCLA, which are routinely ranked as the two top public universities in the country, and you put together their, their Pell Grant students, that is to say the students making, from families making less than $45,000, $50,000, you have more students than are on Pell Grants at the top 15 private colleges and universities in the country. That's the eight Ivy Leagues and what are called the Ivy Plus. University of Chicago, Washington University, Johns Hopkins, Stanford, and a few other schools. So what we offer, of course, is excellence. What we offer is access to excellence. But increasingly, we do so in a context where public funding uh, is diminished. And yet, as some of us were talking about over lunch today, uh, state control has, in, has, has, has increased, uh, and some of the issues that we have to confront are really difficult and really challenging for the future of these great public research universities. So let's, let's just stay on the topic for one moment of the American research uh, public university and so on. And when we think about what kind of impact it's had on society, as you were saying, it's, it's really been quite profound. It, it's had the 
impact of transferring knowledge to the next generation through education, to creating entirely new knowledge through research and discovery, in inspiring innovation and creative thinking among students, and in protecting independent scholarship and thought. So all these incredible impacts. So Michael, as you sit here today, are you worried about the American Public Research University with all of its challenges, as Nick just indicated, a lot of them through political intervention, uh, the substantial withdrawal of state support and so on. Why do you continue to be optimistic about the future of the American Public Research University? Well, I, I'm, I'm optimistic because Americans are unbelievably innovative. We bring people from all over the world. We bring them together. We take the ideas from everywhere. We synthesize them together. We allow charter schools, this school, that school, everything going on constantly. It's an unbelievably innovative society. We are, however, at a moment of brain freeze at just the wrong second in sort of global time. Just as everyone else on the planet has woken up to the value of higher education and just as the world becomes more complicated, we've decided that the forces of evolution in higher education that have been uh, powerful for three centuries here in the United States were, are over. That, that Berkeley, which is the gold standard of the public universities, it's the gold standard of what I call the wave four universities, the research universities that emerged in the late 19th and early 20th century. Harvard, think of it as the, uh, think of it as the prototype of the wave one schools the colonial colleges that became a research university and a college like Bowdoin College in Maine where I used to be a trustee as a remnant wave one school. There's hundreds of them. Uh, Bowdoin and Amherst and Williams and Colorado College and Pomona and Reed College in Portland, places like that. They're fantastic colleges all over the place. Somehow we got into this brain freeze where we thought that evolution would stop. And then along comes forces in the market that said, oh, we've got these technological solutions. We're going to wipe all you people out. Well, both are wrong. They're both incomplete stories. And so I think what's happening and what we need to see happen is more and more innovation is going to lead to new types. Uh, we're basically making the case, if I can put up slide 75, that uh, ASU is a prototype of a new type of research university which is scalable. I'm not suggesting that Berkeley or UCLA scale above their present scale, but if somebody doesn't scale, if some kind of new type of institution doesn't come along, it's going to be difficult. So it's a complicated slide. At the core is knowledge, which we both produce, research universities and colleges. To the left is the full immersion on campus technology enhanced learning platform. Everything that's in the gold side is the schools, the departments, the libraries, all the stuff that we have, but highly enhanced technologically. Moving to the right, then, are the new realms that, once we did that, we're able to operate in. So we added the Starbucks program last year, which now has 5,000 learners in it. We've agreed with Starbucks to produce 25,000 graduates uh, from their partners. That's what they call their employees with no debt and no cost to those individuals. We can do that because we have a technological platform that we built with 150 teaching and learning technology companies that we partner with that allow us to then do what we call Realm 3 learning, which is what we call uh, digital immersion, massively open technology enhanced, where we have a thing called the Global Freshman Academy that we're doing with edX that has had 140,000 students in it since August from 192 countries having free access to a freshman curriculum. And then in Realm 4, education through exploration, again driven by technology and innovation, which is at the root of the spirit of, of, of America and its success, with huge support from the Gates Foundation and NASA and other foundations and other groups were building learning platforms that allow you, if you play a game, based on complete physical, biological, and chemical reality, I'm just using this as an example, that when you're done playing the game, you'll be able to pass any Cambridge A-level exam using that as this high standard entrance exam to a college. You'll be able to pass that exam if you complete the game. The game's not about the exam. The game is learning by doing through exploration using technological platforms that we can now do tied into our School of Earth and Space Exploration, which right now is managing many multiple off-Earth missions. You take all that we're learning from the off-Earth missions that our faculty and our students are managing, you integrate that into a learning platform and you change everything. Now, I'm not suggesting, again, that everyone moves in this direction, but I am optimistic about the notion that new evolutionary forms can evolve, new structural systems can evolve without abandoning something that some abandoned along the way, which is that green dot in the middle. 
which is that living, breathing core of knowledge built around a faculty. So our faculty of 3,400 people, we have 3,400 faculty members, our 3,400 faculty members can be fantastic researchers and scholars and, and artists and dreamers and have face-to-face -face students, digital immersion students, distant learning students, and unlimited numbers of learners through exploration by tying this whole thing together. Now that's not for every university, but it might be for some. And Nick, why are you optimistic? And I would like you to comment also briefly on Berkeley, what you're doing to try to monetize the intel incredible intellectual property that exists among your faculty and that whole echo center there uh, at Berkeley. Well, I'm optimistic because Berkeley is such an incredible institution. It's going to uh, uh, continue, I think, to be valued, not just by uh, the residents of California uh, who show uh, with, well, for example, I mean, this year we had more than 100,000 applications for admission. More than 100,000. For, for how many opening slots for freshmen? About uh, 6,000. Well, 5,000. 5, we also take a third of our students as transfer. So uh, an enormous number of students will transfer from the community colleges of California. And of course, uh, the point there is there's this huge demand. What Michael talked about in terms of scalability is harder at Berkeley. It's harder to do given the nature of the institution. On the other hand, Berkeley became Berkeley in part through state funding that also funded the expansion of the University of California system and did so, and this is the famous master plan of 1960, in concert with the Cal State system and then the community college system. And as the master plan, plan was encoded in 1960, it, uh, it, it involved both insur ensuring that students at community colleges could have the opportunity to transfer either to Cal State or to a UC and the best to, uh, uh, to the flagships. Uh, and it provided a sense that there was, in fact, across the system, differentiation but connection uh, and a common purpose uh, to make sure that California would have the best system of public higher education in the country. And it got there. And it did that. Now, we do have challenges. And, uh, and I think that uh, I described the public uh, funding situation <laughs> along with the public governance situation uh, to say that we're going to have to work through them. But we are innovative. Our faculty is doing extraordinary things. I will say one thing, though, in, in, in reference to your last question. I mean, we are getting better at, uh, at doing intellectual property. We are doing, uh, getting better at doing things like technology transfer. But that's not going to be Berkeley's salvation. Uh, if we help our students and our faculty move their ideas into the marketplace, and we do a better job at that, and we are already doing, uh, I think, an extraordinary job and a very different kind of job than we might have done, say, 20 years ago. We're going to find that these same entrepreneurs, these same discoverers, these same uh, extraordinary leaders are going to be advocates for the university. They will be donors to the university. That's what happens at Stanford. Uh, it's, it's not just from IP. And they will find ways to help us uh, out of our alumni base of 470,000 loyal alumni. <laughs> to figure out how to develop new kinds of models for, uh, for our future and that, I hope, for the rest of the public higher education system in California. Well, it's interesting you say that because I often comment on the fact that there is this uh, seismic shift that's, been, that's taking place right now. You may not feel it exactly, but there is going to be a shift of wealth as the baby boom generation passes on over the next 30 years. They estimate uh, as much as $40 trillion, $40 trillion worth will find its way into foundations and other kinds of philanthropic endeavors. And it's actually, you know, it's a remarkable source of potential for transformative good, of course, if that endowment is used constructively and imaginatively. Uh, so I guess my question to you, both Michael and Nick, is how are you going to access that? In other words, what's the message that you would convey to major, major uh, potential donors about how they can become involved in initiatives and programs that align with your vision and so on? So one of the silly questions I get all the time is because somebody reads the paper and they say that college presidents spend all this time fundraising. I don't spend any time fundraising. None. <laughs> we advance ideas that have impact with measurement and outcomes that some people invest in along the way. 
And so uh, we do not, we don't, we don't fundraise. I mean, and so we have a lot of investors uh, that come along. And so the reason I say that is that, is that I'm hopeful that those trillions of dollars of uh, baby boomer wealth can be, can find a way to come along with, and, and I know there's a lot of people here in Southern California that think this way, and I think it's the right way, that comes along with expectations. I'm not, I'm not interested in investing in College X because it's going to make me feel better because I was an alum there. I'm going to pay them back for all the great things they did for me. Okay, well, that's fine. Give them something for that. But, but, but there, are, there is a need in this brain freeze moment for high-speed evolution and high-speed change at scale. So we live in a country now with 325 million people. The lower half of those family incomes have less than 15% of those people graduating from college. That's a country, 160 million people. A country the size of Germany is the lowest quarter of family incomes in the United States, 80 million people plus. They have less than a 10% opportunity to graduate from college, and that includes people that are in the upper 1% of academic uh, ability. And so, and so I'm just suggesting that there are things to do and challenges to achieve, uh, to, 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 to fulfill, that require investment in ideas, and hopefully that, that capital will be made focused on some of these investments. Well, we'll definitely direct it toward Berkeley and ASU. <laughs> um, let me turn for a moment. There was an article today in the Wall Street Journal about charter schools. It was authored by Nina Rees, uh, who's actually the executive director of the National Charter School Organization and so on. And uh, it pointed out and it mentioned Success Academy and their magnificent results and so on of the tremendous pressure that's being brought on to try to limit the number of charter schools in this nation. Like all the new ones in the state of Washington. <laughs> so, um, or even in New Orleans, which basically uh, had a whole charter district as a result of Katrina. So I, maybe I'd like to turn for a moment to Eva, and Eva, maybe you could reflect a little bit on some of the governance issues that you see, some of the challenges that you've experienced in your battles as you try to just expand your schools from your original school to 41 schools, and I assume that you have greater designs than just 41 schools. So what needs to change in terms of the governance structure to encourage innovation and expansion of charter schools that work? Well, I uh, thought uh, one of the sort of more profound misconceptions I had when I started uh, because I was in politics and I was an elected official and I thought let me take a little bit of a rest from politics and let me go into education where I can just focus on teaching and learning. That didn't work out so well, uh, that plan. Uh, I have found the politics of education more intense than any campaign I have ever run uh, and uh, that is because change does not come easy and there are opponents. It seems kind of crazy on my good days. Who could oppose kindergartners studying science five days a week? Our kindergartners do 135 experiments by the end of kindergarten and yet we live in a world where um, you know the teachers union blockaded the entrance to our school blockaded, tried to prevent five-year-olds from going uh, to school in Harlem. Um, so th it is a highly, highly political endeavor, and we could bemoan that, and there are days that I do, um, but it is what it is. And I think what we need to do is to get involved in the politics, because I don't see it going away. I don't see somehow the you know, Red Sea parting so that social entrepreneurs can start great schools. So I, I personally spend you know, as much uh, time as possible on teaching and learning, um, but I also spend a great deal of time on advocacy, on making sure that there isn't a monopoly of public education, that there are alternatives. Um, that there is a new way of training teachers and that we don't have a kind of closed uh, system. But in answer to the, the last question, because I felt that I really wanted to answer what makes me optimistic, given those slides, which are incredibly, profoundly depressing. 
not only are the results depressing, <laughs> but the fact that the needle hasn't moved uh, substantially is depressing. The fact that uh, remedial courses uh, take up so many resources is depressing. But what makes me optimistic is kindergartners. They're, they're, they're as Michael said, they, they are teachable. They can learn. They have a hunger to learn. You can't stop them from learning. In fact, schools manage to do that, which is incredible <laughs> because they're so resistant to not being taught and not learning. And that's what uh, certainly pains me every day is that you've got these precious bundles who are uh, you know, bundles of curiosity and in th they're passionate learners, naturally so. To them, to a five-year-old, learning is like breathing. That's what they do. It's in their DNA to learn. And yet, by the time they get to third grade, we've managed through schooling to shut that down. And that's what we have to reverse. And what we've seen in this country, and we've seen it in some district schools, and we've seen it in many charter schools, and we've seen it in parochial schools, and we've seen it in some independent schools, that there are schools that manage to harness that curiosity of our uh, poorest students and teach them at a really, really high level. And so what we have to do, I think, is less about governance, although there's a part of it that is there. We've got to create uh, conditions where people can find alternative ideas. People often ask me, is what I'm doing scalable? And I say, well, the district, it's, is that the vision of scalability? In New York City, just to give you a sense of comparison, we're spending $30 billion a year, $24,000 a student, 90% of the students cannot read, write, or do math. So it's not just like a little tiny failure on the margins, it's massive educational failure. And there, is, there are many other better ways. In fact, there are faster and cheaper ways. We at Success Academies are educating kids significantly better for significantly less money. And, so, and, and we're not the only ones. There are other charters uh, in New York City and nationally that are doing this. And so we've got to all embrace alternatives, but any schools that work. We don't have the luxury. I, I came out a long time ago for tax credits, even for vouchers, even though I'm a Democrat, because anything that works to me, I would do anything for my three children to get them a better education, anything. Eva, and so many, I don't think you can students, deny that to other How many students parents. do you have in your 41 schools today? Uh, well, we'll be open with 41 this summer, and we're educating 14,000 students pre-K through high school. And there's a total in New York City of what, about 1.1 million? 975,000. Right. Isn't it curious that a system is so concerned about your 14,000 <laughs> kids? You'd think they would be concerned about the 975,000 that are trying to educate. Are there any questions that, uh, yes? I'm Pat Miller Zoller. So I have a question that's related to the to the point that you were just making and is related to scale as well. So I'm sobered by the fact that the former Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Admiral Mullen, this morning said that the greatest existential threat to security here in the United States he saw is K through twelve education. So we all have to be thinking about, you know, how do we get how do we make this right? Lots and lots of conversation about it, lots of energy put into it. But for you, Eva, and I live actually a block away from Success Academy 1 in New York City, so I know it well. But you are actually educating 1% of, of the school kids in New York City. How do you scale what you are doing to the point of scale? How do you, if you, if someone could make, wave a magic wand and say Carmen Farina is no longer the school superintendent, it's going to be Eva Moskowitz, what do you do? How do you go about how do you go about educating a million students that are across the board, lots and lots of issues, working with the infrastructure that's currently in place? 
Well, I don't think Eva's going to be able to answer that question completely in the next five minutes and so on. Well, I'll give you the 25 words or less version, okay, right. which, is, which is a chart that looks not so dissimilar from, from Michael's chart. We, we are creating an ed institute where we're putting our curriculum online. And you may think that intellectual property is a small aspect of educating students, but if you take something like mathematics, um, the math problems in this country are terrible. It's terrible. We have the worst math problems. It, we basically teach math in the United States of America by teaching card tricks. We teach a set of procedures. So if you were to get really great math problems, and I have spent 10 years collecting the best problems around the world that I can find, I, I would just, if, making that open source, which is what we are going to do, uh, I think that will have impact. Okay, I have let, the let, best we, collection. We might, we might have. Are there any other questions here and so on? Because I want to give. Yes. Um, could each of you give a sentence or two expressing your opinion on the recent um, reversal and appeal of the Vergara decision? It was a decision that relates to teacher tenure uh, in the state of California, as I understand it. Uh, where students brought an action saying that uh, their, I don't know if it's civil rights or whatever, were being jeopardized because of a system where I believe that it was based solely on seniority, where any that were all decisions made when you had to lay off teachers and so on, the first, the youngest teachers would be laid off. It really wasn't based on a system of capability and so on. Is that a fair uh, comment on it? And the lower court ruled that yes, those students were correct and their rights were violated as a result and that system shouldn't exist and that was reversed by the Court of Appeals as I understand it. Can I jump in on that yes. quickly? So I, th I think you've touched on a really important issue. You know, how do we get uh, the lowest income, highest need students to have some of the best teachers? And I think that's a, that's a challenge that, that we've got to address and of course the courts stepped in on that. But at the same time, I think there's a lot we can do on the broader policy issues and just in general within schooling to say let's change this situation where right now the system is set up so that the best teachers go to the best students right because we look at proficiency we need to find a way to say how do you reward growth how do you encourage the best people to go to high need schools and i think there are a lot of possibilities within the new law essa to try to push that at the state level so so the court case is, is as you mentioned is an important one to kind of work its way through the system but at the same time there are a lot of efforts going on now to have states define equity, educational equity, such that teachers are given incentives to go to schools that are with high need students as opposed to going to the place where they can get the highest proficiency levels. And we have found uh, through our activities and so on that we can attract teacher effectiveness, the teachers who are extremely effective at high levels are willing to go into high need schools. But they're only willing to go into those high need schools if they can actually have a say in the instructional program of that school and so on. That's been a, so we have given them roles and responsibilities and increased compensation as a result of it to move to the high need schools because the whole system in this country where you have the least experienced, least content knowledge individuals who are teaching the high need students has not worked and it will never yield the results that we want. Did you want I was to? just going to quickly add that I think when you think about um, effectiveness and how you're going to define effectiveness, that's an, an area that's been such a challenge at the federal level. And if you allow for states to define effectiveness and you're, you say, I'm going to push you or force you, mandate you to move those people to a high need school, then of course every teacher will automatically be labeled effective. Right? So it's so important that we find a way of having that be a, a real measurement, multiple measures of performance, so that you really do have the ability. That's the first step that has to happen. Who's effective? And then how can we give them incentives to go to a high need school, to be successful there, to work with a team? But if you, if you cut it off at the knees by saying, well, whoever's effective, we're going to move them all to a high need school, you, you won't even be able to take that first step. So I think that's another thing that's important for people to to support is this idea that we have to have some accuracy, some, some accurate measures of performance to use. Let me, let me just add that tenure is one of these words completely captured by various groups, including labor lawyers uh, throughout our society. Tenure was very importantly designed to protect uh, academic freedom on the notion that one theory is attacked by another scholar and destroyed by another scholar along the way, and you needed order in that process. And so tenure was intended to provide freedom of movement intellectually. 
It was then, it was then captured by many groups to be basically a labor contract. And so the word is even a misnomer. It, it, it actually has a purpose. It has an intellectual purpose. And so at our institutions, it has a meaning and a purpose. It does not allow you to not perform and still be employed. It, 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 at our institution, if you don't perform and you have tenure, you're, you're going to change your performance or you're going to have your position eliminated. It's, it's not a lifetime employment. It's a lifetime license. It's a different thing. I think we have time for one last question. Was there another question? Okay, well, thank you very much. Appreciate it.